Good morning, everyone. Really awesome to see you all here. So today in this last session before lunch, we will talk about real life building public facing websites with SharePoint 2013. So just out of my curiosity, how many of you have already built a real life public facing website with SharePoint 2013? Excellent. Did you enjoy it? <laughs> so I hope that nevertheless, with all the experience that you already have, this session will add some value to your knowledge. As you all might have heard, SharePoint 2013 contains some new and improved capabilities for building public-facing websites. In this session, we will see at what those capabilities are and how would you apply them in real life scenarios. My name is Valdek Mastikas and I am five times SharePoint Server MVP. I work as a SharePoint consultant at a Dutch company called Mavention. I blog, I'm on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Pinterest, Whatever it is. So before we proceed, let's take a brief look at what the new capabilities in SharePoint 2013 are for building public facing websites. First of all, we have the SP site URLs that allow us to associate multiple host headers to host name site collections. Then we have device channels that allow us to optimize how the website looks like across different devices. Another thing on our list are image renditions that simplify working with the same images and different sizes of it across the site. Then we have the search engine optimization features that help us optimize our website for internet search engines. Next we have the design manager that allow us for more HTML centric approach for um, implementing branding to our website. Then we have translation services that allow us to translate the content to multiple languages. Another thing on the list is managed navigation that allow us for decoupling the physical structure of the website from its navigation and URLs. Another thing are friendly URLs that, as the name says, allow us for creating more internet search friendly URLs. And last but not least, we have the search driven publishing, which allow us for publishing content from multiple sources using search. So as you can see, Microsoft has done really, really a lot of investments in this release to help us build really great public facing websites. In the past weeks, you might have seen some demos showing off those capabilities. Nothing wrong with that, except for the fact that very often demos of the product are aligned with the design scenarios that the product has been designed for. In this session, you have a chance to hear about how would it look like to apply those capabilities to perhaps some other scenarios. So once again, you see the list of the new capabilities uh, that are available in SharePoint 2013 for, bu pub for building public facing websites. And as you can see, I have highlighted some of those capabilities. Does anyone in the audience have any idea why? Should. They work. <laughs> yes, they do, and no, it's not the reason. Anyone else? There is no bad answers here. Come on. Uh, 
I'm not sure if I will get back to that, but uh, come up to me after the session and we'll discuss that in more detail. As for the highlighting part, any ideas? Anyone? Less there? The reason for the highlight is that those features require SharePoint 2013 search to work. Image renditions are highlighted slightly differently uh, because there is one another funky thing about them and it's very useful to keep that in mind when planning and designing for new public facing websites. So SharePoint 2013 offers us two ways of publishing content on public facing websites. First of all, we have the classic publishing model that we already know from SharePoint 2007 and 2010. Then we have the brand new thing called search-driven publishing. In the classic publishing model, uh, we, or the physical location of the publishing page determined its location in the URLs and a navigation. For building content aggregation, we used the content query web part and the site collection was the boundary that we had to deal with. In SharePoint 2013, aside from that model, we can use the new search-driven publishing model that, as the name says, uses SharePoint 2013 search to publish the content. One of the great things that you can use with the new search-driven publishing model is managed navigation that allows you to decouple the physical structure of your site from its navigation and URLs. Another great thing about search-driven publishing model is that it allows us to use multiple content sources which can be within your site collection, in another site collection, in a whole different web application, or maybe even a whole different farm. And to have that content or a mix of it published on your public-facing website. Because all of the content is published using search, we have to use the new content by search web part for building content aggregations. And the really awesome things about that is that it not only allows us to build static content aggregation like overview of news, but it also allows us to build truly intelligent websites and I will talk more about that in my session tomorrow. So the search-driven publishing model obviously offers some great benefits for building public-facing websites. First of all, it allows you to separate your authoring experience or even environment from your publishing experience or environment. The great thing about that is that you can optimize both of them for their distinct purposes. So on the authoring side, you can add some additional tools that will support the content management process, while on the publishing side, you will ensure that your website is optimized for the internet and for the search there. Another great benefit of using search-driven publishing model is the ability to reuse content. With search-driven pu search publishing model, uh, we can really build websites using the content-centric model. We can have multiple content repositories um, with separate responsibilities for it and have all of that published on one public-facing website. Using search, we can also publish content from LOB. And finally, another great benefit is that search allows us for decoupling structure of our website from its navigation. Another, so one of the great strengths of SharePoint 2013 search are its analytics capabilities. 
So we can not only find what we look for, but we can ensure that what we find is relevant to us. The really awesome thing is that we can use those analytics capabilities on our public facing website. And two ways of doing that are content, is content targeting and content recommendations. And actually the best part is that both of those are for really great deal available through customizations. No development there yet. Finally, last uh, thing to keep in mind is that search-driven publishing scales way better than the classic publishing model. So even though search-driven publishing offers are some great benefits, there are a few things that you should keep in mind when planning and designing for new public-facing websites. As I've already mentioned, there are some uh, features or capabilities, if you like, that require search-driven publishing to work at all. Those are, for example, cross-site publishing, managed navigation, or XML sitemap. No search, none of those guys is going to work. When working with search-driven publishing, there are a few ways in how you can plan the content publishing model and how you are going to lay out the information architecture. One way of doing it is to store the content in the same site, so actually in your publishing site itself, and to use managed navigation. In that scenario, every single publishing page is going to have two URLs. It's physical one where it's stored and the one that you have configured for it using managed navigation. As you might have known from the search engine optimization perspective, having multiple URLs linking to the same content is very bad. Why? Well, the reason for that is that if your content is going to be ranked, that rank is going to be split between those two different URLs because in internet search is going to see that as two different pages. So when using uh, managed navigation with inside content, as I call it, you have to be really careful not to get into that trap. As I already mentioned, if you want to build content aggregations uh, using search, you have to use the content by search web part. It is awesome. It is very powerful. Nevertheless, it's a whole new thing that doesn't look like anything that you might have already known. By default, it uses a new rendering model based on JavaScript. Yes, it is dynamic. Yes, it is part of apps. No, content by search is not an app. Nevertheless, uh, JavaScript is optional technology in browser and it can be disabled. If you build a content aggregation that is rendered using JavaScript, optional technology, what do you think your users or your visitors will see if there is no JavaScript? Anyone? That's right, they won't see a lot. So it's not necessarily bad as long as you plan for it and you keep that or you take that into account in your design and you communicate that to your customers. And with search-driven publishing, there are also a few quirks. One scenario that we used to do quite a lot in SharePoint 2010 was to uh, build content aggregations using the related information to the current page. So, for example, you would be on a review page for a book and you would like to display related books by the same author or related books about the same topic. 
In SharePoint 20, 2010, using the content query web part that was there, that was improved uh, comparing to 27, that was not a problem at all. In SharePoint 2013, things look a little different and in a way that if that page review or, or that book review page would be retrieved by search, its contents are known very late in a process. Too late for content by search to use that as input parameters for its queries. So if you want to display related content based of so on some value of the page that is coming from search, there is a little more work to do than you might think. Out of the box, SharePoint 2013 allows us to retrieve related information based on URL tokens, so part of the URL, URL query string parameters, or the values of the fields of the current page. But if the page is coming from search, there are no fields because all of the content are managed properties surfaced by search. And if JavaScript is a no-go for you, luckily there is a way to avoid it. SharePoint 2013 contains a fallback rendering mechanism based on XSL. If you look for it in the UI, you won't find it. It is there though. The biggest challenge with that is that if you choose that path, you are on your own because all of the out-of-the-box available functionality uses the out-of-the-box default JavaScript-based rendering model. So if you choose for XSL, you will really find yourself very quickly developing stuff. So to recap, search-driven publishing offers new scenarios and capabilities and benefits, but it also introduces new impact and new challenges that you should take into account while planning and designing for building public-facing websites. Search-driven publishing will allow you to achieve great results, but don't just expect blindly for this to work for your specific scenario. <clears throat> Whether you are going to use search-driven publishing in your public-facing websites or not depends really a lot on your requirements and your scenario. Either way, that should be one of the very first cho choices in your engagement or in your project. Why? Because of its impact. Whether you are going to use search-driven publishing or not depend or determines how you are going to structure your information architecture. The first question that you will have to ask yourself is whether you are going to store all of the content within the same publishing site or whether you are going to use separate catalogs. And if so, where in your environment they are going to be stored and how the content <coughs> publishing process is going to look like. The next question that comes directly after that is whether you are going to use managed navigation or structural one like the one that you know from SharePoint 2007 and 2010. And should you choose for managed navigation, that has to be modeled using, using a taxonomy, so where, is going, where that is going to be stored in your farm. The next thing that search-driven publishing impacts is the architecture of your solution. How many site collections are you going to have? One or more? And if you're going to have more or multiple site collections, um, how are you going to ensure for consistency <coughs> once the whole thing is in production? Right, because you might be needing to deploy the same assets to different site collections. 
And another thing that's important for, from the solution architecture point of view is the location of assets. And with assets, I mean here things such as images referenced in content, documents, PDFs, whatever. So if you have a separate catalog somewhere in your farm, you have to ensure that all the assets that that thing links to are available in every single place that publishes that information. And finally, the last thing that you have, well, there are two more. <laughs> Another thing which is quite big is that SharePoint 2013 search uh, uses some parts of the old fast. It is very powerful, but it also has some requirements when it comes to the hardware and the whole capability part of your infrastructure. So with that, you have to ensure that your environment is capable of, se of serving search. And the last thing is the knowledge and skill set. The obvious things are probably very self-explanatory. The great thing is that SharePoint 2013 search allows you to do really awesome and cool stuff, but this is something that you will have to take your time for and learn. That's not obvious. So one of the new things in SharePoint 2013 search-driven publishing is the cross-site publishing. As the name says, this thing allows you to cross the site collection boundary and publish content from other <coughs> locations on your site collection. If you have seen any of the Microsoft demos recently, you might have heard that this thing is being re uh, referred to as product catalogs. The great thing is, it's not only for products. You can publish with it any kind of structured con any any kind of structured content that you have. So a short recap what cross-site publishing is. It's a content publishing model based on SharePoint 2013 search. Cross-site publishing is based on catalogs, which are in fact lists and libraries. And because all of the content is stored in flat lists and, li and libraries, we have to use taxonomy to define its structure and hierarchy. So when you look at catalogs as they look like out of the box, you might think, well, that's for products. I'm not building an e-commerce site. And this has for a part to do with the fact that out of the box there is the product catalog site definition available for creating site collections. The reality is that we can use any site definition at all for it. Additionally, the product catalog site definition also comes with the product catalogs list. Guess what? We don't have to use that either. In fact, every list and library in our farm can be published as a catalog. And this is including the pages list, which is very, very awesome if you look for a uh, cross-site publishing, publishing pages. If you choose to use catalogs with anything else than products, you have to do some additional configuration if you want the content recommendations to work. The only thing that you have to do for that is to add your um, content identifier, so the column that uniquely identifies every single item in your catalog as a mapping to the usage analytics ID managed property in search schema. That managed property is used by search to uh, map recommendation items. 
And here on a slide, you can see a mapping like that, where out of the box you have the OWS underscore product catalog item number crawled property, and I added to that my own crawled property called OWS underscore Q underscore text log. So every single list and library in our farm can be published as catalog. Search indexes information from that list and makes it available within the whole farm or wherever you decide to publish your search service application. The important thing to keep in mind here that it's only for content. If you decide to use that on a document library, it's only going to index the metadata. The binaries are going to physically remain in that library and are not going to become a part of search index. So if anywhere in your content you're going to reference an asset or even a file which is published from catalog, that reference is going to be through URL. And if you are going to open that published content, it's going to try to load that item from its original URL. So you have to ensure that from the permission perspective and from the <coughs> URL routing perspective, those assets are available everywhere they might be needed. One common scenario, or probably the easiest scenario to explain this, is imagine intranet and imagine that you would do content management of press releases on your intranet. Obviously, your intranet is not available to anonymous visitors of your websites. Using cross-site publishing, you could then publish the press releases catalog to your public-facing websites available for anonymous users. In fact, when publishing a list or a library as catalog, there is the setting that allows you for publishing that information for anonymous users. If those press releases referenced any images, guess where those images would have to be stored? They would have to be stored in a location that is available to both users on the intranet and users on the internet side of your environment, right? So this is something that you really have to think about when planning and designing for catalogs. Any questions about catalogs so far? No, I love it. So another cool capability that we have in SharePoint 2013 are image renditions. Image renditions allow us for really easily working with different sizes of the same images and SharePoint 2013 scales them automatically for a server side, what allows us for optimizing performance of our website. The interesting thing to keep in mind here are, is the scenario where you have multiple site collections as a part of your uh, public facing site landscape. In such case, the odds are very high that your assets are going to be stored elsewhere from where your content is managed. Unfortunately, out of the box, all of the interface is optimized for working within the boundary of one site collection, the current site collection that you are on. And to help us deal with that, Microsoft has added the suggested content browser location setting in your site collection. And using that setting, we can add a number of locations in our environment where we store images, what allows uh, content authors to browse to those locations rather than copying URLs. So that's cool and very, very helpful. Your end users are going to love you for this. So another thing that I've already mentioned are permissions and images are just 
one type of assets that you might be referring to. So once again, keep in mind that wherever your catalog is going to be published, from that location and those users have to have access to those images. And another thing which is kind of limiting for image renditions is the fact that all of the options available in the UI around working with image renditions in content are limited to the current site collection. So if you will insert an image in your page and you will set or you will try to choose or apply to it a an image rendition, that list is going to be retrieved from the current site collection, not from the site collection where the image is stored. In fact, taking a step back, you won't be able to pick that image rendition option at all because SharePoint is going to look, hey, you're trying to insert an image from another site collection. I'm not doing image renditions or ex on external images. So from the, on one hand, we are very, um, we have very many ways in which we can scale and we can reuse content, we can have multiple site collections, but on the other hand, the capabilities that we have are still limited to one. So what's, what's up with that? Some time ago, I have built two um, free solutions called Mavention External Image Renditions Enabler, and I think that's self-explanatory, and Mavention Size Renditions. And I think that if you are serious about using image renditions in multi-site collection environment, you have to use either those two solutions or build an equivalent yourself. So the first guy, the Mavention External Image Renditions Enabler, will enable the image rendition picker on external images. So no matter if the image that you have inserted in your page is internal or external, it will allow you to apply the rendition query string parameter to it. The second solution is, does a little of a trick uh, because if you use image renditions out of the box, SharePoint apply, applies the rendition ID query string parameter. The problem with that in multi-site collection setups is that what is image rendition ID 5 in your site collection doesn't necessarily have to be the same rendition ID in the site collection where the image is physically stored. So instead of using rendition IDs, Mavengine size rendition changes the whole mechanics of applying the image rendition to apply it using the width and a height. And as you might expect, those are going to be the same across the different site collections. Any questions about image renditions? You guys are a brilliant audience. I love you. So another new capability, very helpful for, for building public-facing websites, is XML sitemap. And XML sitemap allows us to compile an overview of the content that we have on our site and have that submitted to internet search engines. With that, we can help internet search engine discover and index our content. The great thing about XML sitemap in SharePoint 2013 is that it just works. It is available out of the box. To scale, because it has to sometimes index very, very many pages, it's based on SharePoint 2013 search. And the really cool thing about the XML sitemap available out of the box is that it's really clever. If you take into account all the ways in which we can publish content in SharePoint 2013, like catalogs, like friendly URLs, physical URLs, or we can even have those things mixed and matched, nevertheless, SharePoint 2013 XML sitemap is going to pick all those things up. 
For building the URLs, SharePoint 2013 XML sitemap work will first try to resolve the SP site URL map to the internet zone. That is, of course, if your site collection is a host name site collection. If there is no URL map to the internet zone, it's going to pick up the URL from the default zone. If your site collection is, however, uh, an, a no host name site collection, a path based site collection. Thank you, Matt. XML sitemap is going to first look at the internet alternate access mapping configured at your web application. If there is none of that, it's going to default to the default zone. So, XML sitemap that we have available in SharePoint 2013 is really cool. However, there are a few things that you should keep in mind when promising stuff to your customers. First of all, the XML sitemap, the way it's implemented in SharePoint 2013, doesn't implement all of the capabilities for XML sitemaps that are defined in the XML sitemap standard. For instance, there is no way for us to determine the priority or the change frequency for pages in our site. You might be arguing whether it's useful or not. Nevertheless, should you want to use it, you can't, period. XML sitemap, the way it is built in SharePoint 2013, is not extensible. It is what it is. And the worst part of it all is that because it's that clever, because it supports all of those different content publishing models that we have available in SharePoint 2013, it's really extremely complex for any of you guys here to build one yourself that's going to do better. It's going to cost you time and money. Any questions about the XML sitemap? Do you want me to ask next time? <laughs> Can you mention any usage scenarios for that? I mean, in which situation we can use it? You mean for using XML sitemap? So the question is whether I could call some usage scenarios for XML sitemap. Well, um, if you build public facing website, probably the first thing and the most important thing you want everyone to do is to find your site and find the content on your site. And in you, if you have built your site correctly and you have really awesome links, your site is very popular, it's only a matter of time that internet, site, internet search engines are going to discover that content and include it in their index. However, you, might, you may still have some pages in your site that are not that good linked to. XML sitemap is a great way to submit all those links and pages to search so that it knows that there is some more content that it couldn't could have not discovered yet. No? So when using managed navigation, and this is something that I've already said, one way of structuring your content is to store it in the same site where it's going to be published. In short, I refer to it as in-site content because it is in the same site. So, using managed navigation, you would apply friendly URLs to those pages. Which is cool, and which is exactly what every customer wants, except for the fact that from now on, every one of those pages is accessible for people on the internet, including search, through two different URLs. It's physical one, where it's stored in SharePoint, 
and the friendly URL that you have defined in the managed navigation. So from the search engine optimization perspective, you want to ensure that search is going to index that page on the one URL that you want it to be found on, right? <coughs> and the way for doing that is to use the canonical URL. Canonical URL is an HTML tag that you can include in your page and when search indexes the content of that page is going to find the URL on which the information from that page is going to be indexed on. The great thing is canonical URL is available out of the box in SharePoint 2013 as part of the search engine optimization feature. It is a hidden feature, nevertheless no one stops you from enabling it. And you should. One of the great capabilities of SharePoint 2013 search is its REST API. It is a very robust, rich, and flexible API, and we can use that to have the content from our site published to other systems or even apps Go apps. And by default, it is disabled for anonymous. No big deal there. You can enable it and it's not that complex. In fact, to make it easier for you, I've already wrote about it. And the, although REST API is very useful for publishing information from your site to other systems and apps, there's one more scenario which might even be more common for you to see than building apps. Do you remember when at the beginning of this session I said about the quirk when trying to um, search for related content based on the information coming from the same page? There you go. That's the way you can solve it. So when your page that comes from search is loaded, you can then use SharePoint 2013 search REST API to execute another query that using the information from that page is going to search for related information. This is exactly how you can do it. And if you want to see a real life example on our uh, website, on the mavention.com website, we use this to load, I think, related blog posts. So we have a page of a person working at Mavention, for example, me. And if you click on me, you will get some information about me. And at the bottom, you will see some blog posts that I wrote that I are already published on our site. That uh, functionality of our website uses this SharePoint 2013 search REST API to load those articles based on my name. So another big change in SharePoint 2013 with regards to building public facing website is how you build user experiences. By default, they are very dynamic and therefore based on JavaScript. That engine behind the JavaScript based rendering is new. So you will have to learn it because it doesn't resemble anything that you might have known, no matter if you are a SharePoint developer or not. And the thing with it is that that uh, mechanics that uses the JavaScript based rendering uses SharePoint plumbing for the rendering process. With that, it depends on the browsers that SharePoint 2013 supports. As you might have heard, Internet Explorer 6 and 7 are not supported by SharePoint 2013. 
The problem with that is if you put that information on a public facing website. Because your customer may have a really fair number of visitors using those old browsers and that number will depend on the market. So if you are a public organization or you do something in healthcare, the odds are very high that there will be some, still some people using those old browsers and justifying cutting them off will be really hard for you. So what is the alternative? As I say, SharePoint 2013 uses or has implemented a, a fallback rendering mechanism based on XSL. And the reason it is called fallback is that because SharePoint 2013 uses it mainly when it discovers that it's internet search engine coming to the site and trying to index the content and then it will serve the content statically random from the server. Because it do does not want to depend on the amount of support for JavaScript that the particular search engine might or might not have. So it is there and it is available for you to use. However, well, the great thing is that you might already be familiar with XSLT. I mean, we've been doing it for years now. Content query web part, search results, that used to be all XSL. Another great thing is that there are no browser dependencies whatsoever. We can use that even on IE3 and that's going to work. The really challenging part is that there is very little support out of the box available for XSL-based rendering. In fact, there is very limited or as good as none uh, functionality available that will help you build your own public-facing website which uses XSL-based rendering. Nevertheless, it is a choice that you have and that you should consider every single time you plan and design for your public-facing website because your customer might need just that. And in fact, on our own website, so the mavention.com and mavention.nl, we use that as well. And the reason for that us was that we well, we wanted to comply with the Dutch government accessibility laws. And according to them, the majority of the functionality of the website and the most important functionality of the website should be available when JavaScript is disabled, period. And they don't really care whether you like it or not. That's the way the law is. Yes? Mm. So a while ago I asked exactly the same question to Microsoft and so far I didn't get any answer on that. Um, nevertheless, SharePoint 2013 has some really extensive caching capabilities so you might want to use that should you notice any uh, significant performance impact. In fact, I think just last week the uh, um, web content management team from Microsoft has published two articles on estimating and planning the capacity for building public facing websites. Yes? Can we use uh, XSLT too? No. Yes? So you mean the using the SSL HTTPS on your website? Exactly. SharePoint is known as a resource hog and 
Well, so that depends a little on how you build your website, right? If you use everything that is available out of the box, yes, that's going to cost time and money. Um, so I know a bank in Brussels who have their, or in, Brussels, in Belgium, in Brussels, yeah. <laughs> Brussels, comma, Belgium. Uh, who have their public-facing website built on SharePoint 2010. So, but probably not the engine, the financial engine that you know, drives the whole... Well, um, I'm not sure how far they are with it now, but they were really considering that doing that part there as well. Which some people thought they were nuts. I mean, like, well, I think you, sh you should at least try. Matt. So the new UI... Minimum download strategy is disabled out of the box on public facing websites. That's what I wanted to ask you, is there a way that we can leverage that? If, is there a way that we can enable that and leverage that for sites where we have consistent Chrome, sites where we want to just refresh portions of the page? I think that big challenge with that is that if you look at how MDS, so the minimal download strategy works, is that it uses Ajax to load portions of the page. And to do that, it appends a pound, so it appends it a pound. It appends a pound sign and an anchor somewhere to your page to know what kind what part of the page it should refresh. On a public-facing website, however, that would mean that one and the same URL can get different content depending on the last part, which is not being indexed, I think. So although I'm not 100% sure, I think that is exactly the reason why MDS is not available or it's not enabled by default on public-facing websites. So if you wanted to affect that, like on the prevention side, if you wanted to affect that yourself for the um, recent Yes. Yes. Uh, can we use this in conjunction with uh, the uh, request management to identify if you know, the browser supports JavaScript or not? And what would you like to do with that information? Uh, maybe a, a custom solution if the JavaScript is not you know, supported. <coughs> maybe a, another. Hmm. I think that would be a very expensive solution because everything that you do, you'd have to do twice. So, although you could, I don't think you should. <laughs> yeah. If I understand it right, that's also only available on hosted site collections. The request management. It is. That's what I've heard. Okay. In estimates. That would be a great question for Spence. He is here. Hourly rate zero pounds. <laughs> Available only throughout this week. <laughs> I didn't say that. Oh, it's a record. So one more thing that I wanted to tell you about before we start wrapping this up is building cross-device experiences. And with the internet market and the increase of mobile devices used to serve the web, we just can't ignore it. We have to ensure that our website will look good or will look acceptable across all the different devices that are out there. And there are a few ways in which we can do it, amongst which we have the SharePoint 2013 device channels and we have the responsive web design. And those two are about optimizing the, how the content is displayed. So the great thing about responsive web design is that it has nothing to do with SharePoint. You can apply that on any website whatsoever. The whole idea is there to use the CSS media queries implemented in browser to determine which style sheet is applied to your site and how the content is going to be displayed. So from the responsive web design perspective, we manage properties. We manage the width and the heights of the screens, right? 
So we don't target our website for a particular device, we target our website for a particular size of the screen. One very important thing to note here is that despite the device used to serve the web page or the website, the same HTML is served from the server. And from the optimization possibilities that we have available through responsive web design, um, we are limited by the CSS support that a browser might have and optionally by JavaScript. On the other hand, we have the SharePoint 2013 device channels and those are built around the idea that we can create channels which are buckets and we can map those to user agent strings, so identifiers of browsers. And using that information, we can decide how the website is going to look on different devices. So where in responsive web design we had properties management, we have here device management. The downside of it is that every single time new device appears on a market and is being used to browse your website, you have to ensure that it falls into or it is associated with any of the device channels that you have. And with that, ensure that that device is going to get great user experience of your website. Using different uh, device channels allows us in SharePoint to use different master pages. And within page layout, we can use device channel panels. As a result, we have the ability to serve different HTML depending on the browser used to serve our uh, site. So this is one more thing that you have to take into account from the internet search perspective. And although it increases the, increases the management effort that we have on our side because we have to manage all the different devices, it offers us more flexibility because we can serve different HTML, right? So from the search engine optimization perspective, the preferred way is to use responsive web design. Why? Because it's easy for internet search engines to crawl your website once, index that content, and then you know 100% sure that that HTML is relevant to every single device out there. The great thing about device channels, though, is that they can be abused, if you will, for separating the authoring and publishing experience, and this is exactly what we have used it for on Mavention.com. So this is one last slide that I'd like to cover with you very quickly, is that SharePoint 2013 offers us our really great possibilities for building public-facing websites. On the other hand, though, there is much more impact from the disaster recovery perspective. First question, where is your content? In SharePoint 2007 and 2010, you knew that the content of your website was in a content database of your site collection. In SharePoint 2013, if you use uh, search-driven publishing and cross-site publishing, that content might be anywhere, everywhere. So how do you uh, ensure for the disaster recovery of your website if that content is somewhere else? Another new uh, and great improvement from the configuration perspective is the fact that we can configure search settings for our website within our own site collection. Guess where those settings are stored, and I give you a hint, it's not your site collection. Those settings are stored with the search service application, and if you lose that, you will lose all of the search configuration of your website, including the analytics data such as recommendation and user reports. Another thing that is interesting are the catalogs. 
we all know about the love that SharePoint has for using goods. Not here. Catalog connections are made and are uh, stored based on URLs. So if at some point you want to move your site from, for example, production environment to another environment and to put it on another URL, you will have to remap those connections because they, won't, they will break. So with that, the important thing to know is that please, don't underestimate the effort that is involved with disaster recovery of a complex public-facing website built on SharePoint 2013. There is no doubt that SharePoint 2013 offers us really great possibilities and capabilities for building public-facing websites. Aside from that, it also uh, introduces new design concepts, new impact, new stuff that we have to think about. Eventually, I'm sure you will all achieve great results with it. For your reference, I have included some extra links and I would like to thank you for attendance.